Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Lewis Hoffman. I'm one of the co-chairs along with uh, my wife, Dr. Hedlin Claire Hoffman, who is uh, not able to join us today, but was an important part of planning and organizing uh, this presentation. We're excited that we've got a number of wonderful speakers that will be joining us today as a part of this uh, Zoom presentation. And I'm just going to get us started a little bit with kicking things off. One thing I would request as we get started, just as part of looking both at a humanistic approach to uh, doing things by Zoom, but also taking into consideration some of the, the safety concerns that can come up when talking about sensitive topics such as multiculturalism is that I would encourage everyone if possible to keep your cameras on during this. If there's a little point where there's a distraction, certainly we understand if you turn them off during that, but uh, being able to see people and their reactions, um, particularly around sensitive topics can help create some of that uh, sense of safety as well as some of the sense of connection that's really important to all of us in, uh, in humanistic psychology. Uh, I wanna start with a, a disclaimer that this presentation came about from discussions about a book that came out in uh, 2019, Humanistic Approaches to Multiculturalism and Diversity, Perspectives on Existence and Difference. And four of us that are part of this presentation are co-editors of this and uh, some others also were uh, contributors to this book. As a part of the transparency, we just wanna make sure and mention that uh, the proceeds uh, from sales of this book, the editors do receive a portion of the royalties of that. Our intention is not to just promote this book, but use the book as a springboard into deeper scholarship, which really was the intention of the, the, the book. And, um, um, I'll come back to that here in just a minute. Our objectives for today is that hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to identify one power issue that's important to consider when working with clients, um, be able to articulate two humanistic strategies for working with individuals with disabilities, and be able to uh, identify one consideration for working from a from social justice perspective, social justice issues from a, from a humanistic perspective. And hopefully there'll be plenty more on this as well. Looking a little bit then at um, moving into this presentation, I want to talk briefly about the, the history and the humanistic psychology and some of the early movements in multiculturalism emerged around the same time. And humanistic psychology also became popular around the time of the civil rights mo movement. And there were certainly a number of people in humanistic psychology that were part of the civil rights movement, often separate from their professional identities. And there's a lot of lost opportunities with, despite there being a lot of shared values as Theopia Jackson has talked about between black psychology and humanistic psychology, as well as some other shared values with multicultural perspectives in general, there hasn't been much of a, a convergence until more recently. A matter of fact, even as recent as 15 years ago, a lot of multicultural topics were very controversial and not always very welcome at, um, at Society for Humanistic Psychology conferences. We're glad that there's been a significant change in that now to where we even see many areas where individuals in, from humanistic psychology are being recognized as leaders in looking at multicultural perspectives as well. But it's been a difficult path to get to this point. The ideas for this book started around 2010. At the time of when the book was first starting to be envisioned, it would have been very difficult for the book to come into fruition, which is one of the reasons why it took nine years for the book to actually be published from when we first started talking about it. At that time, there was just too little scholarship on humanistic psychology and multiculturalism, and also a lot of work that humanistic psychology needed to do on itself to be able to get to a place where a book like this was possible, and even a presentation like this um, in many ways was possible. So we're glad to see the progress, but it's important that we don't view this as we're done, become complacent in the work that we've done and in what we have to offer. 
When this book came out, we really thought of it as a starting point for deepening conversations and advancing scholarship. Not even necessarily a statement on where we're at, but something that can be used as a step forward to where we can go. So this book always was intended to, to vision forward. And this presentation, the idea is for this to actualize some of that, to move forward. So we're gonna start with four presentations from people that contributed to the book. And then we're gonna shift gears and we have three people that are gonna present that are springboarding from it in a sense, that are moving beyond taking us a little bit further as some of our presenters will do too in their um, presentations that are presenters from the book that will take it beyond what we had looked at in our book. We're gonna try and really make sure to stay on our, our time frames because we wanna make sure there's plenty of time at the end for conversations and, and dialogue. So if you have questions along the way, please keep track of them. You can uh, post them in the chat and I will read them later if you wanna remember them. Um, but we won't have questions and answer after each presentation. We'll hold those to the end. So with that, I'm going to go over ahead and turn it over to our, our first speaker, Dr. Nathaniel Granger. Thank you, Lewis. So uh, the chapter that I uh, that I contributed to the to the book is microaggressions and humanistic psychology. And first, I think it's important for us to know the definition of microaggressions, which is brief and common place daily verbal, behavioral, and environmental um, indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial, gender, sexual orientation, and religious lights and insults to targeted groups. And under, under the umbrella of microaggressions, there are three uh, categories. The first one is microassaults, which are conscious, deliberate, and either subtle or explicit, explicit racial, gender, or sexual orientation, biased attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors that are communicated to marginalized groups through environmental cues, verbalizations, uh, or behaviors. They are meant to attack uh, the group identity of the person or to hurt, harm the intended victim through name calling, avoidant behavior, or purposeful discriminatory actions. Uh, the N-word, for instance, would be considered a micro assault. And I don't like using the term the N-word, by the way. Um, I find that more, just as of offensive as just saying the word nigger, but for all practical purposes, I will say the N-word if it should come up through this presentation. Micro insults, These, this is the second category under micro, uh, microaggressions. And micro insults, micro insults are characterized by interpersonal and or environmental communications that convey stereotypes, rudeness, and insensitivity that demeans a person's racial, gender, or sexual orientation, heritage, or identity. Micro insults represent subtle snubs, frequently outside the conscious awareness of the perpetrator, but convey an oftentimes hidden insulting message to the recipient. Uh, the, 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 the tight lip smile that people of color often experience from their white counterparts, uh, the smile that even though it may say, um, you know, I welcome you into my space, but, it, but, but, but there's a hidden message that demeans the recipient of the smile, letting the, the recipient uh, uh, be very aware that they are somewhat beneath the person who is doing that, that tight lip smile. Now, micro invalidations, this is the third form of microaggressions under the, uh, uh, the third type of microaggressions. And this is perhaps the most dangerous types of micro microaggression. It communicates environmental cues that exclude, negate, or nullify the psychological thoughts, feelings, or experiential reality of certain groups such as people of color, women, LGBT. LGBT. Uh, in many ways, micro invalidations represent the most damaging form of the three microaggressions because they directly and insidiously deny the racial, gender, or sexual orientation 
reality of these groups. Um, a type of micro invalidation is when Black Lives Matter is uh, uh, reputed with the term all lives matter. This, this uh, uh, re re repudi repudiating the Black Lives Matter with all lives matter, it denies the experiential reality of uh, the Black life. The power to impose reality upon marginalized groups represents the ultimate form of oppression. When we, when we consider microaggressions, we have to do it within the concept, context of morality. When working within a humanistic paradigm, morality is often scrutinized based on culture. An individual's culture is the attitudes, values, beliefs, and behaviors shared by a group of people passed down through generations and various cultures have different worldviews of what is morally right or wrong. While some aspects of morality seem to be universal, what is judged to be morally wrong in one culture may not matter in another. And so when we look at cultural differences, research has found that some cultures seem to have more dialectical thinking while others think in a more linear fashion. For example, Western culture defines a moral person as strong, autonomous individuals that stands up for their for theirs and others' rights. However, in Asian cultures, uh, uh, to have a uh, excuse me, Asian cultures have a stronger orientation towards law-abiding behaviors and being altruistic and uh, effective towards others. And so, what may be morally right to me may not be morally right to to someone of another culture. What's morally right in America is not morally right in in Asia. Uh, even looking someone straight in the eye. Um, in, in America, we are taught, I was taught as a little boy to always look, my dad would say, always look me in the eye. You always look someone in the eye. Whereas in Asian culture, culture, it can be somewhat offensive when you look someone straight in the eye. And so culture, our culture, although outside our conscious awareness for most of our life, yet foundational, uh, to our development also de determines how we navigate therapy, be it receiving therapy or counseling people from different cultures from our own. Judgments based on skin color uh, uh, make genuine character invisible. invisible. And so uh, dealing with a myriad, myriad of prejudgmental views of character de determined by prejudice creates psychological tension in, in individuals who feel invisible and serves as a context, contextual factor impeding the therapeutic process. And so oftentimes in therapy, um, whether we realize it or not, and more oftentimes we don't realize it, our culture uh, plays a role in how uh, therapy is uh, not only uh, delivered, but how it is received. And so we have to be very mindful of the, the subtle messages that we uh, allow ourselves to, to put, put out. And, uh, and, 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 and understand this, in therapy, uh, the, the perpetrator of the microaggressions could be, of a, could be African-American, could be a person of color, whereas the client may be a, a, a white client. And so we're looking at the power differentials here in that uh, as a black therapist, I'm in a position of power and my client who is white is not in a position of power. And even in that, I can be, I can be microaggressive towards my client. And also too, from a racial standpoint, my client can be very microaggressive towards me. And so these microaggressions can be contextual factors impeding the therapeutic process. And so, uh, in, in clinical practice, drawing from uh, Sue, there are four applications for clinical practice. Uh, the first one is making the invisible visible. As long as microaggressions remain hidden, invisible, unspoken about, and excused as innocent slights with minimal harm, individuals will continue to insult, demean, uh, alienate, or oppress marginalized groups. Secondly, um, establishing expertise and trust. 
As Sue stated in 2010, acquiring knowledge and understanding of the world views of diverse groups and clients are all important in providing culturally relevant services. Also, providing appropriate services to diverse populations. What works for one group may not work for, it for another group. Helping professionals must begin the process of developing culturally appropriate and effective intervention strategies in working with clients who are different from them. This includes developing skills that involve interventions aimed at organizational strategies in working with clients, I mean, uh, uh, organizational structures rather, policies, uh, practices, and regulations within institutions if they are to become fully competent and lastly, it is important that clinicians become aware of their personal values, biases, and assumptions about human behavior. And that was last, but certainly not least, it is very important that we recognize our personal biases and how we bring those personal biases into, uh, into uh, uh, the therapy room. All right. And the take home message here is microaggressions have a uh, detrimental impact on psycho psychological well being. Uh, awareness of one's personal bias is forestated. Fears and stereotypes is paramount. Uh, we have to be able to recognize that and, and, and also understanding that microaggressions originate from privilege. Uh, this is very crucial and that uh, in the clinician's aspiration for multi multicultural competencies, it is important to, to include in that quest an understanding of white privilege. Also making the uh, uh, obs obscurity discernible should always facilitate an in, in increased dialogue. You know, um, when, when I first started uh, my research on microaggressions, the term microaggressions was, was, was thrown around uh, just quite loosely and people would pride themselves because they gained a little piece of knowledge with microaggressions and they would call people under the, under, under, you know, on the table or throw people under the bus based on microaggressions. And they would point out, that's a microaggression. Oh, you, that's a microaggression. Well, that was not the intent uh, of, of uh, microaggressions. It's never the intent to uh, shut down communication, but rather uh, 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 making uh, the obscurity the obscurity discernible is to facilitate dialogue and not shut it down. And microaggressions, lastly, are factors that can gravely affect the uh, uh, clinical outcome. The clinician of color, though in a position of power in the clinical in the clinical setting, can be the victim of microaggressions from white clients and must be able to recover quickly so as to maintain the therapeutic relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel. All right, next up is Ethiopia. Nathaniel timed that about perfect, right on 12 minutes. So Ethiopia, you're up here next. Oop, you're on mute, Ethiopia. I see that. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here and good to see such friendly faces and getting to uh, get to know others as well. Uh, my contribution to this conversation is to look at the parallel processes for the development of black psychology with humanistic psychology and the potential synergies here, as well as appreciating the divergent places as well. And more specifically, I hope if I do this correctly, I, I will be contributing to the third uh, learning outcome that we're focused on, which is social justice issues from a humanistic perspective. And let me start off by saying that for me, I am truly wanting to honor this critical conversation. Uh, for full disclosure, I'm sharing what has been my experience as a black clinical psychologist though it may be representative of, of others, I'm not speaking for others. I also think it's important to say that I am not only the uh, deeply involved in humanist psychology, but I'm also serving currently as the president for the Association of Black Psychologists. 
which is an extremely unique situation to be in at the intersection and a nexus of COVID-19 and racial pandemics at this particular time. However, I think it's relevant to this conversation so you can locate where I'm coming from for your interrogation. And I'm looking at my time to make sure I'm gonna be ending here in an appropriate way. I wanna appreciate also what my dear colleague Nathaniel just brought to us because he's reminding me once again of the power of words and the power of science. And he's done a phenomenal job moving forward the, the conversation of microaggressions within the HP arena. And yet I also wanna to continue to underscore where this thought was originally coming from and which is the work of Dr. Charles Pierce who's, who was a black psychiatrist. That becomes quite relevant when we think about where we are today and more specifically if you have not, but many of you probably have, the statement that on January 18th that the American Psychiatric Association put out in terms of their apology to black BIPOC, or that term means black indigenous people of color for the role in which they have played in um, promoting structural racism within the field of psychiatry. That becomes relevant because when I think about the birth of black psychology, it was born and conceived right around the exact same time as humans and psychology for some similar reasons. Those reasons being that the dominant discourse within our field did not fully represent the lived experiences of those professionals in the field, more specifically, a number of professionals of color come into the field, not just to sort of help people, but specifically I'll say, coming in to help my people. So clearly there's something that's coming up that these scholars are recognizing that they're not getting all of the psychosocial support and well-being that they should and then wanting to contribute to the capacity of psychology to meet that need. When I think about the various lens within our field, the various forces, humans and psychology, I was, I, I was drawn to it because of its foundation in terms of the centering on the unique experiences of the person, all the values around the approach of the whole person so that we can find that collective synergy. However, what was missing for me as a scholar growing up in this is the lack of attention to situational settings that can contribute to someone's psychological distress or more specifically, there's an assumption that everybody comes ready for self-actualization. And I've always been curious that there's something else before that for certain folks before you can promote self-determination and meaning making, it's assuming that folks are in their fullness of selves. As I bring this model forward, it's for me specific to those experiences of folks who may be of African ancestry, but I offer it as a model for other conversations. And what I mean by this is when we think about the time of enslavement and the time of slavery here in the United States, I concur with what many of my scholars will talk about is that that was a time of torture, absolute torture, enduring forms of torture. It's much more complex than the, than the complex simplicity of trauma. If, and I don't wanna go into all the details and we're gonna make the assumption that the scholars in the call recognize this. But the point I do wanna make is where was the psychological well-being when folks were coming out of that enslaved time period, moving through Jim Crow and moving into where we are today. So we would say there's still a certain level of psychological residuals because you can free the body, but the mind was still psychologically encapsulated in a couple of ways. First and foremost, there was a complete erasing of who we were, how we were, how we think, what our values are, could not speak our language for 400 plus years. So clearly, if you are in that type of a setting, how can you step into self-determination and meaning making and actualization when no one has said, excuse me, but this is your starting point, which is very different than my starting point. So there's a gap there that I would submit that HP and other scholars within our Western psychology did not pay attention to. And I would be so bold as to say, this is some of the contributing factors to where we are today a quote dis-ease that went unattended to and unaddressed, not only within pre predominantly African communities, but for all communities. So let me just go over briefly 
how we think about the schools of thought within black psychology, because I think that's imperative. It's a different frame than how we approach it from a Western model. In our Western model, we're very clear about the forces, each force, and also they are almost independent of one another. There's certain people who can locate themselves in, in whichever camp. And there may be some who talk with each other, but in general, they, they steer away from one another. They may even get into some jockeying around power and authority into, in terms of which one's most valuable. And I think many would say now that, you know, one of the challenges we have is how to um, advance cognitive approaches within a humanistic space in terms of recognizing the fullness. But that's a, that's a different conversation. What I wanna bring here is that in black psychology, we, we have what we call three different schools of thought and they are all intimately connected with one another in terms of a conversational place. And the first one would be that called the traditionalists, which are those black scholars from the very beginning whose intention it was, was to use traditional psychological theory in trying to understand and explain the behavior of African-Americans. And some of the scholars there would be um, Kenneth Clark and Mamie Phipps, Phipps Clark in terms of the um, Dahl study and others, uh, Price Cobbs, William Greer, Alan, Alvin Poussant are some of those who would be in that space. The next school would be that of reformists. And, the, and for the school of reformists, their focus was to develop new theories in understanding and explaining uh, black behavior, African-American behavior. And some of our scholars there are gonna be William Cross, who began the whole conversation around racial ethnic identity and that whole field that, that populated further from there. Uh, Dr. Joseph White, who's been considered the father of black psychology, Nancy Boyd Franklin in terms of her work in, uh, in, for black family therapy and Janet Helm in her work as well. And there's many others who would fall in this space, but again, that's their focus. For both these schools, they're starting from here in this soil. What is the experience of African-Americans in white America, in America, and how do we help uh, shift the storiness so we can understand our health and well-being from a cultural perspective? The third school are considered the radicalists. And for the radicals, they are saying our epistemological starting point is different, that they're reminding themselves that there was an African, a blackness, a, a science, a way of thinking and being before we hit these shores. So in order to really um, free ourselves from the psychological residuals of the untreated psycho-spiritual um, assaults here, we need to actually go back to the African continent, sit with our Sangomas and other spiritual leaders and understand the science, intentional word, not just culture, but the science of how to be and what it means to be human. And then to critically consider that for its relevancy for us here in the United States. And some of the scholars in that area are Naeem Akbar, Francis Kressling, Kobe Kamban, Linda James Myers, Wade Nobles, Kevin Washington and, and many others. This group, again, as I said, is would, would, would clearly say that our European or Western approaches to psychology are not adequate for the actual experiences of many people of African ancestry. And one of the shifts in understanding this is that for from this perspective, it's not a question of what does it mean to be human. The, issue is that we are all spirit beings having a human experience. So it's a different starting point because it, it, it intimately starts from a connection among all spirit life. May that be not only mother earth and, and the spiritness of those who are around us, but it's also the spirit of those who have gone before us in terms of our ancestral wisdom and knowledge. And again, if you remember the movie R Rwanda, it sort of did a beautiful job of illustrating some of that, but it also speaks to the spirit of those who are coming before us in terms of our centeredness. I bring this up so you can really understand the uh, different schools within black psychology. We are not monolithic. There are different perspectives and ways of being and thinking. However, we are centered in the spot of we're starting from what does it mean to be healthy and whole from an African or black perspective. The way that for me lines up with humanistic psychology is that it, it really helps to 
lay the ground, the foundation for HP to further its work in making sure that all voices in different ways of being, different sciences, different psych understandings of what it means to be human or to be spirit have an equal seat at the table. And that's a hard charge because when we look at the history of HP, it too has struggled to sort of get its place at the table. So that's another way in which we have synergy with one another, but you're there. And so as HP continues to move itself forward, taking the leadership role as it should within issues of multicultural and, and diversity, it opens the door for other um, ethnic psychological ways of being and psychologies to sit at the table as well too. What I, and so when I reflect back here on the conversation that my dear colleague Nathaniel brought to the table, I would submit that black lives matter in order for all lives to matter. Because there is this true belief and true science that all of life began within Africa. And if we do a critical deep dive of many of our scholars, particularly Carl Jung and others, a lot of their science was born from their experiences within Africa. So if that's the case, then Black Lives Matter in order for all lives to matter. And as we know, there, particularly in the work of Kirk Snyder, there's a certain polarization because of what can be perceived as such intensity between what it means to have a visible white face and a visible black face, and we get distracted in that. But our capacity, meaning black scholars, our capacity to move this science forward and to have all other um, brain power like HP to interrogate this information is going to move the field forward. Um, I'm trying to keep my time here. Uh, can you give me a quick check, please, uh, Lewis? You're about 30 seconds over. Per, oh, oh, okay. So I'm going to close there then <laughs> with the contributions of this conversation in terms of understanding how social justice issues from um, are informed in terms of HP because everything I just said is living and breathing social justice. Thank you. Thank you, Theopia. Wonderful. All right. And Juliet is up next, and I'm gonna see if I can stop my screen share so Juliet can share. Thank you. So um, my emphasis today is disability issues. An approach from a humanistic perspective, the term disability begins to open up considerations of relativity and paradox. Do also, you not seeing the screen yet, just, just in oh, case you know. You're not seeing it yet? Okay, mm -hmm. let's see here. What can I do? Uh-oh. I'm not quite sure what to do here. If you prefer, I can just use Maybe I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you do it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you can go ahead and I'll just let me know when to switch. Okay, there you go. I have to stop sharing my screen, I guess. I'm sorry, I'm taking up this time. I have to stop sharing, right, in order to do that. So. Have um, you got it? <laughs> yes, I have it. Okay. I have it up. Okay, okay, great. Okay, so um, as I started to say that, um, that the term disability, it begins to open up considerations of relativity, of paradox, and, and then questions arise as to who is creating the definition or making the decision that a particular disability exists. So a compassionate attunement to the diversity of lived experience is crucial and a humanistic psychological lens holds this phenomenological lens on lived experience as a given. In a paper proposing a decolonial theory of disability studies, Dearth and Adams emphasized that what we need to move away from is this kind of psychological language and traditions that are 
based on certain philosophies of the 18th century, we might namely say the Enlightenment project, where anyone different from what was perceived as normal was thrust into categories and terms such as deviant or underdeveloped or defined as other. Echoing this stance, um, Darius and Ebenstein in two different papers explore that the ancient Greek myth of um, Hephaestus and how at least in one version of the myth, seeing that his foot was misshapen, his mother Hera threw him away from Mount Olympus. So what they're saying here is that really this casting away of those who showed variations from the norm first articulated itself in ancient Greek culture. Thus, at least in the mainstream colonialized Western world, we can trace things back this far. And as Evanstein points out as well, the advent of industry and the movement away from agrarian life resulted in less um, acceptance of disability because then there were shifts in um, Western uh, society in terms of what is valued, who is valued contributing to society. So we see this going back quite far and mainstream society uh, may continue with this othering and assumptions of underdevelopment, but one's family, a person's family can counteract some of these stereotypes and see their loved one in their fullness and encourage broad participation in life. For instance, George is a case manager with a regional center in California, and he was born with anthropogryposis. And he said that he grew up in a family who treated him exactly the same way that they treated anyone else. Um, but, and that kind of carried over into his everyday life. When he went away to college um, and he was walking through the door of the library, somebody said something about praying so that he could fix his hands. And he was completely taken back from that because um, he felt that they had an impairment in judgment to, to, um, to assume that something was wrong with him and that he doesn't let it define him as a person. But he said that his family really set the tone for that, how he could move forward in the world. So that says something about us and how we bring our own perceptions into family therapy too. So as Olgan and Pledger um, said, um, the psychology must shed its light, shed its emphasis on disability as abnormal, deviant, or special. Uh, George happens to be my brother John's regional case uh, uh, worker for many years. As an advocate for feminist approaches to disability and other contexts of diversity, Alel Koble Temple, like George, also speaks of the impact of family. And she's an example of someone in the educational community who's really fought so much for equality and, um, and done so in social and professional contexts with the support of her family. She's a, one of the growing number of psychologists who identify as disabled and who are in leadership positions and who seek and speak from human experience about the social political um, construction and the realities around disability. Slide. Speaking um, of the socio political and realities of everyday experience, while George has been able to drive to have energy to function in a full time job and receive health care benefits, many others are not in the same position. In the United States, there are disparities in regard to who may even be eligible for access to healthcare resources. When these disparities are considered not only from the standpoint of disability alone, but with the added component of such realities as systemic racism, the divides in care are even more striking. As disability rights education and defense fund attorney validate, um, ye validates, race and disability together may have a previously unaccounted cumulative impact on creating health disparities. So then adding gender, socioeconomic status, LGBTQ context, 
on top of race and ethnicity amplifies imbalances in who may receive quality care. And we're seeing this all over the place. Um, healthcare disparities exacerbate the insults of those already marginalized. Some experience financial hardship due to the high cost of medical and psychological care, throwing individuals and families out of the safety of a home, out of a car, out of an adequate income. And um, recognizing these, disparity, th these disparities is not enough. Um, as um, Perrin says, humanistic psychology must leave academia, engage in the community, and re-engineer systems that stifle justice, unquote. Race-based traumatic stress is a real phenomenon. So advocacy must be added to the lexicon of how humanistic psychologists describe themselves and direct attention to what Perrin is referring to as the mesa, the micro, and the macro, what we talk about in those contexts. Next slide. So coming back to inquiring into the unique lived experience of any given individual, we can't separate out the sociopolitical impacts on our own perceptions of psycho as psychologists and how this may confine or expand our thoughts and feelings around disability and thus impact how we work with an individual, with a family, with a community who identifies as disabled. A kind of curious inquiry may serve to broaden our awareness to include considerations of the social, the idiosyncratic, the archetypal, the creative, the nuanced, the implicit, even subtle nature of being, as Theopia was bringing up. Next slide. Seeing disability through any singular perspective, this is a quote from Evanstein, seeing disability through any singular perspective limits and distorts its full meaning. So how might we in applied psychotherapeutic and healing arts contexts further along our understanding of the unique lived experience of disability and the meaningful expressions that articulate such? Tommy uh, was a very athletic boy growing up and he engaged in a lot of different sports until a terrible bike, bicycle accident occurred just after high school that found him paralyzed from the waist down. He discovered also in high school that he liked art. Um, while he was in the rehab hospital, they tried to set him up with um, a computer to try to do art with his hand, you know, just with the keys, but it didn't resonate with him because he was so used to moving around, you know, and it, it you know, he was having a sense of um, despair about what was going to happen as he moved forward in his life. As he was leaving the rehab hospital, he was given a, um, a service dog and he named that dog Weaver. And as he and Weaver were getting to know each other through the weeks and months, he looked at Weaver one day and he, he thought to himself how appreciative he was of this companionate being and how could he capture this in some way, some expressive way. And he remembered his interest in art and he had his friends put down a, a canvas in his garage and he put paints on his wheels and on Weaver's paws and swirled around in the wheelchair, creating art. And this started a whole new uh, meaningful experience for him that would not have come about uh, had his situation not opened that for him. And as Robert Romanishan said, quote, soul moves slowly and never in straight lines. It drifts and meanders, drawn to edges and margins, pausing at thresholds and loitering at the lip of an abyss, trying to hear who whispers from below, unquote. It was relatedness and mutual care between two beings that spurred an emergence, a transcendent creative flowering in Tommy. 
And then Tommy relates that he would like to be known as Tommy the artist and not Tommy the disabled artist. Tommy's experience with weaver and art informs conceptions of therapy and the interpersonal field in a number of ways. Humanistic psychology reaches beyond the merely personal to the transpersonal and to our relationship, even to the non-human. And as Snyder would even say, to awe. And we meet each other where we are in all of our layers and complexities. Deepening inquiry into phenomenological nuances around selfhood via animal-assisted therapy is one way of inviting here and now contact and relational emergence from, as Lack and Walton relate, a non-interpretive stance to allow clients to make their own meaning from their interactions with the animals, even if one cannot express oneself with words. Um, if you've seen the documentary entitled The Horse Boy about psychologist Christine Neff's son, uh, bear, who barely spoke and had continual uh, outbursts, uh, a person of, uh, with autism, the experience with Mongolian shamans and horses is a profound example of um, how we can open our minds about what therapy is from a humanistic um, uh, perspective. In regard to working therapeutically along this continuum, Veronica Lacks, existential humanistic equine therapy and other Others who describe case examples that include the non-human offer much in regard to expanding upon Buber's I thou considerations and open to other contexts beyond talk therapy. Speaking of it's opening to other contexts, how much time? Uh, we're, we're right about at the end of time there. Okay. Um, I, I think I will close um, with a quote and then a short poem. And the, that this is from Hoffman, Stuart, Warren, and Meek, cultural competency and sensitivity in therapy and psychological theory mandate that therapists develop the flexibility to work with clients with a variety of conceptions of self. And very briefly, a poem on the last slide. I am not I, I am this one walking beside me whom I do not see whom at times I manage to visit and whom at other times I forget. The one who remains silent when I talk, the one who forgives sweet when I hate, the one who takes a walk when I am not, the one who will remain standing when I die. And there's one more slide with my brother and I wishing you a very wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. All right, the next is David St. John. Lewis, if you could uh, get rid of the slide. So I, we, yes. we just, yeah, thank you, yep. appreciate that. Um, thanks folks uh, for being here. I, I do wanna uh, thank my fellow editors, especially Lewis, who really uh, did a lot of work uh, in regards to the book, as well as I believe Roxanne and Vanessa, uh, it, you know, to, to make this, possible, which is really important given uh, I was speaking to Philip, I think he's here, a colleague last week about how it's been a year since we were supposed to be at the last convention about that. It's a little under, but it's getting close to it. Uh, and how, uh, how much has gone on since then? It's, it's been, uh, uh, for all of us, I know, a really crazy, intense uh, year. <clears throat> And certainly, too, I miss the convention uh, and, and the conference, the idea of us getting together and looking forward to doing that in person sooner or later, right? But again, uh, this, this will have to do for now. Um, I am going to uh, actually uh, do a little bit of drifting and meandering now, if, if I may. Uh, I have not had time to prepare for this uh, because like everybody I'm assuming here, we are all very, very busy and stretched thin. Uh, so I wanna to speak to that uh, for a little bit. I don't think that's accidental. 
Uh, I think it's very much a part of the culture we're living in. Uh, it's certainly in the United States, if folks are at, in other places in the world, I don't think it's all that much different, meaning we are all uh, uh, scrambling to just try to stay in the same spot uh, in so many different ways, but certainly in psychology. Uh, recently, I learned, uh, it, it wasn't I didn't learn it, but I, I, I was reminded again how uh, in, 19, uh, in the mid-1990s, when I was uh, graduating from undergrad, about to start my uh, doctoral program, uh, I went to Wayne State University in Detroit. I remember being uh, in the, uh, the student union looking at a career board with uh, a, all the different careers and how much people would make uh, in regards to those different careers. And that might be engineering uh, or you know, being a teacher and a psychologist. And I've always remembered the number, it was somewhere around $76,000 a year in the 1990s. Well, recently given uh, my work, I'm an executive director of a psychological organization. Uh, I was looking into what are the current uh, salaries of psychologists, uh, along with social workers and counselors. Well, it's about the same for psychologists, meaning uh, it's around, I think it's 78,000 to 80,000, depending on where you look, which is to say, uh, over the last 25 years, uh, our uh, salaries have been stagnant which is actually very consistent, not just in the healthcare professions, but pretty much every other uh, profession or line of work out there. At the same time, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, inflation has grown around 200%, just a natural incline, about 2% a year, which means we are making much less money now than we would have back then, even if you're making more. So, that, that idea that uh, we are being uh, exploited uh, economically uh, is something very real uh, the, for all of us. And we are blessed to be able to continue to work in the last year, at least I'm assuming most of us, through this medium of Zoom or some version of it, we've been able to teach or meet with clients uh, so that we ha are really privileged in that sense, but we too are continually being exploited. And uh, a big, uh, big effect of that is to continually be exhausted and having to stretch ourselves like we did in graduate school in undergrad, and it just continues. Uh, so I, I do want to point out how we might consider that as core to uh, the, I'm going to speak about America, my uh, speaking to my brother recently, and he used the phrase American madness is what we've been experiencing in a very heightened way in the last year uh, in regards to uh, the pandemic and the continual racism uh, that uh, Black Lives Matter has been confronting in this kind of second wave of Black Lives Matter uh, since, since the summer. Uh, and and uh, the whole Trumpian uh, maliciousness that all of us have lived through in the uh, last four years. Uh, it, it, it's been uh, uh, truly intense. And when I, I use the phrase madness, I, I, it, that's not uh, metaphoric. There is certainly a, a form of madness going on socially uh, in the sense of there is a significant portion of the population. Uh, I, I don't know what the percentage is. I hope it's only 20%, but that's certainly high, uh, that are acting from a delusional perspective, right? And again, that's not metaphoric. I wish it was metaphoric, but it's quite literal. And I think most of us can, it can likely agree, though I certainly won't speak for you. So what do we do uh, as, uh, I know many of us here are cl uh, clinical uh, psychologists or therapists of one kind or another, my, uh, maybe it's social worker counseling. Uh, how, do we, how do we understand, how do we uh, help our, our culture in the United States uh, overcome this madness that we're experiencing. And it's not a new madness. Uh, the madness, of course, goes back to the origins of the United States. Uh, and the origin of, of the United States is this, um, this 
hypocrisy, contradiction inherent in the Constitution that so beautifully talks about freedom and liberty, and then in the same document talks about slavery. So the idea of both freedom and, and oppression is the original kind of madness that we have uh, usually tried to deny. And when I say we, I'm, I'm speaking of that, that uh, the, the kind of uh, universal we of the United States, if, if I may, the, the social body and whoever has the privilege to be a part of that and actually have voice, which has changed over the years. So over the last uh, 250 soon to be years, we have witnessed uh, more and more justice actually, which I think ultimately we should feel good about. There, are, uh, We can certainly point out all the different people that have sacrificed themselves in regards to uh, trying to overcome this madness that is very much a part of our history and our, our, our current kind of functioning. So maybe, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about R.D. Lang recently, uh, who the Scottish uh, existential uh, psychiatrist, who working in the 60s, which was another time of madness, of social madness, uh, brought up the, the idea that the people we work with uh, often are, 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 aren't, it, it's not a breakdown, he said, it's a breakthrough if we work with a client uh, in a respectful, compassionate way. So as, as we struggle to both work with individuals, with families, with communities, and I, I think ultimately the nation itself, per, perhaps this could be a, uh, a breakthrough too, as opposed to just a breakdown. It certainly feels like a breakdown. Uh, and I think for any of anybody following you know, politics, just, just in the last uh, four or five months since the, since the election. I think we, we've seen uh, a lot of acting out, a, a, a lot of potential breakdown. Uh, and I think the question for us as, as therapists, uh, as, uh, as thinkers, as social justice advocates, how do we turn it into a breakthrough so that we can grow from this experience? Um, I, I don't have the answer for that. I, I, I think we're all struggling to, to better understand it. I think experiences like this are certainly uh, helpful and important. I do think one of the things that is, is crucial and one of the things I know um, that on a daily basis uh, I, I confront is community. How do we uh, both create and sustain communities, both in the physical local sense, as well as uh, a community like uh, uh, the Society for Humanistic Psychology uh, and the other communities that we can reach out and unite with, like the Association for Black Psychologists uh, and all the other folks that are, are fighting so hard to, to uh, keep their heads above water both as individuals and as communities. Uh, that has been continually under attack. I think uh, the whole concept of community is one that has uh, uh, been eroding for at least the last 50 years, if not longer. Uh, and one of the areas I think it, it, at the heart of this madness to, to bring back the, you know, that, that's been going on for the last few hundred years, the contradiction, the hypocrisy has to do with the tension between democracy, which is about community and the idea that everybody in a true democracy has a seat at the table when decision-making is happening. So we have democracy on one hand and we have unfettered um, uh, coercive exploitation on the other. And th the only word that comes to mind for that is capitalism. Uh, and I am a reluctant anti-capitalist. I am not, you know, I'm somebody that in many ways have benefited from capitalism. But the idea that it, we have a economic system that is, is divorced from democracy. So uh, ultimately, I, I, I think recognizing these contradictions and recognizing and, and uh, acknowledging and speaking about them is, is truly important. I think one of the things that uh, we're trying to do and have has been happening certainly for the last four years is the idea that democracy 
and an authoritarian approach to economics, again, think capitalism, cannot work together as at least in the way that we've formed them. Uh, so ultimately a big part of social justice, of course, is to recognize that we need economic fairness. Uh, so the, the fair distribution of, of, uh, of resources is crucial. And the, the, the role of racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, these are all ways to disconnect, right? To divide the uh, people uh, from, uh, from ultimately uh, coming together and really uh, uh, fighting for, for all of our rights. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that made at least a little bit of sense. Thank you, David. This next presentation is going to be by Zenobia Morrill, who was not able to join us, but she was able to record a video for us. So I'll go ahead and start her video here. Hi, I'm Zenobia Morrill from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and I'm really just delighted to have been invited to join the conversation about the book Humanistic Approaches to Multiculturalism and Diversity. I think the enriching potential of humanistic psychology to inform a deep embracement of dignity and human rights is really brought to the fore here, and yet the authors moved into addressing humanistic psychology's edges and its culturally bound foundations to call on the field and correctively honor that multiculturalism is inherently rooted in a humanistic ethos of the dignity of all people. Today, I'm speaking with you all just briefly about some of the research I've done on the intersection of humanistic existential psychology and feminist multicultural psychology, particularly as these inform the responsible navigation of power dynamics and psychotherapy. And this intersection between humanism and multiculturalism has been referred to as an evolutionary alliance by Dr. Lillian Comos Diaz uh, that could move psychotherapy forward. So if therapists are to sharpen their multicultural competencies and deepen their awareness as the authors write, how then would psychotherapy be transformed what would be different? What would this look like? And what implications does this have for navigating power dynamics? The background to the idea of a contact zone and the title of today's presentation is that when I received the invitation to join this panel, I was reading a paper about power in participatory action research, and the term contact zone came up. A colleague and I began discussing the idea of psychotherapy as a contact zone. To explain, participatory contact zone was used by Maria Torre to apply to research as sites where people representing radically different standpoints come together as research colleagues around a common inquiry. So there's a resolutive element to the term when used here. But it was first used in literary analysis circles by Mary Louise Pratt who described contact zones as social spaces where cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in contexts of highly asymmetrical relations of power, such as colonialism, slavery, or their aftermaths, as they lived out in many parts of the world today. And I thought about the research I was conducting and the aftermaths that seemed to be lived out in clients' and therapists' narratives, the grappling of history and the now in the healing endeavor. And I thought psychotherapy might be considered its own contact zone, so to speak. Perhaps even in the individual format of psychotherapy, there is a task of bearing witness to the confluence of these myriad factors across ecological levels and through time that Pratt referenced that influence people's lived experiences. This makes room and in my opinion highlights 
the potential for critical community and liberation perspectives to forge the natural alliance between humanistic existential and feminist multicultural perspectives. So time does not permit that I get into all of the findings of this study, but I will just briefly touch upon the nature of the research I conducted and one noteworthy point of tension and reconciliation within this presentation. In wanting to learn about the synergy across humanistic existential and feminist multicultural psychotherapy, I interviewed 14 master therapists or people who were distinguished experts at facilitating therapy through one or both of these theoretical orientations. From a constructivist social justice research epistemology, I used grounded theory analysis to understand these master therapists' experiences of navigating power dynamics in psychotherapy. Some participants consented to have their identity revealed and include, but are not limited to, some of my fellow panelists in this discussion and authors of the book at hand, Theopia Jackson, Nathaniel Granger, and Lewis Hoffman. So although I'm not there live, I'm certainly extending my gratitude to them for their time and participation. One thing I wish to highlight was that all of the master therapists in this study described that they use their expertise to empower clients. First, this is a big divergence from a medical model focus, which is on symptom reduction as the goal of therapy. Rather, symptoms from existential humanistic and feminist multicultural therapist perspective, perspectives were sometimes considered to be normative responses to social issues and obstacles, such as housing insecurity. Instead of trying to eliminate symptoms, humanistic existential therapists described the perspective that symptoms or distress are important to explore because they carry the potential to offer meaningful inroads to unique insights and possibilities for change. However, there were perceived points of tension with what empowerment was interpreted to mean and the extent to which empowerment was built upon the idea of the self in psychotherapy. One feminist multicultural therapist shared, this sense of getting to your ideal self, that's really easy if you're a white guy, but if you're in a society where you see images of you being killed on the streets almost on a weekly basis, it's really hard to think, what's my ideal self right now? And what does that mean when I get pulled over if I'm a black man and I'm thinking, oh, what's my ideal self right now? Because that cop might or might not be thinking that. So these systems that we think within don't fully encapsulate the lived experiences of minority folks on an ongoing basis. I think that's the tragedy when the field, the majority of our theories are built on white men who have some complex identities too, for sure. But let's think about whose voices aren't represented and why. Another feminist multicultural therapist, Judith Jordan, co-founder of the Relational Cultural Theory, elaborated that she aimed to empower clients' healthy relational capacities, not to build the self, she noted, which is a critique of psychological theory, but to empower others, to empower others, to empower others, she shared, sort of as a community ripple effect. But this wasn't in such stark contrast to humanistic therapists who shared that they were really empowering one's capacity to connect and attend to their experiences, not so much empowering a self per se. Humanistic therapist Art Bohart shared his feelings that Rogers' concept of self-actualization has been misconstrued as reinforcing a narcissistic view of the self and privileging individual needs above collective community values. Bohart clarified his belief that the self is more like a map with which the client is navigating the world. This map is not fixed, he felt, but rather meant to be revised with learning. He said, Rogers believed that growth and therapy meant both strengthening the self and opening up to other people. What you're doing in therapy, in a funny kind of way, is moving beyond the self. You're moving up to where 
The ultimate goal of person-centered therapy is to become more open, and that means to be both open in and open out. And if you're more open out, then you're going to be more respecting of other people out there as you become more respecting of yourself. It intrinsically means moving toward connection. When these points of tension are reconciled, it appears that the master therapist participants across orientations are viewing the self as a map. The site at which the client's lived experience can be the data that inform their healing. And this is getting to the core category, but without going into the main finding of the study, if we stay with what this means for empowerment as the goal of therapy, then the therapist is facilitating a consciousness or awareness raising process that is not so much about empowering a Western notion of the individual a contextual self, but in contrast, empowering clients to understand themselves as embedded within their relational, ancestral, societal contexts. It is also a process of reclaiming power that has been taken away, according to feminist therapist, Laura Brown. Therefore, Empowering clients and empowering relational and community healing is meant to be mutually informing. And that's really what this compatibility or alliance reveals. Critical consciousness, a liberation psychology concept, was thus put forward by a therapist who identified as both humanistic and multicultural as a construct that can merge this tension. Critical consciousness establishes that understanding the self as a relational cultural being and facilitating clients' ability to draw these connections is empowerment that brings together the humanistic self with the multicultural context focus without imposing what this means to the unique client in the room. This master therapist participant who identified from both orientations said, we use that power, that energy, to have the client reconnect with who they are, reconnect with the strengths and knowledge and critical consciousness so that they have the energy to connect with their inner healer, which we all have, to empower themselves and co-participate with us. We as therapists, we're facilitating the healing process, but the healing process is also a liberation process. In thinking about this compatibility between liberation concepts and humanistic psychology, I remembered Lisa Vallejos and Zonia Johnson's chapter that concluded with this very point. And I couldn't help but also consider Carl Rogers' later work on personal power, in which he wrote that person-centered therapy was a quiet revolution. And he wrote, it confirms me and my conviction that lasting revolutions are brought about not by propaganda or mass demonstrations, but by changed people. Any person-centered enterprise is, of necessity, extremely threatening to 99% of the established institutions in Western culture. I will end with a sentiment from Lillian Comas Diaz that supports the very basis and foundation of the book we're discussing in the hopes that this presentation fructifies further application of these very important constructs, both their history as the opiate Jacksons and others chapters touched upon, as well as the evolution of their most basic precepts as Lewis Hoffman and other chapters as well articulated. Comas Diaz wrote, Humanism drinks from multicultural fountains, and multiculturalism reaffirms its humanist core. Likewise, the evolution of psychotherapy requires a renewal of both its humanistic and multicultural origins. As midwives, humanism and multiculturalism witness the birth of an inclusive evolutionary psychotherapy.
Thank you all so much for including me in this conversation today. I wish I could have been there live, but I appreciate the expansion of the virtual format that allows me to participate. And please feel free to reach out. I'll leave my email here. Next up is uh, Saba Islam. Hey everyone, um, Dr. Hoffman, if, perfect. I was just gonna ask if we can be on gallery view just so we can see each other. Um, hi everyone, as Dr. Hoffman mentioned, my name is Saba Islam and my presentation is titled, A Narrative Account of Multiculturalism and Diversity Challenges in Higher Education. I want to start off by emphasizing my hopes for this presentation. Oftentimes, we discuss issues of racism and white supremacy in an intellectualized and cognitive way. For many, this may be a preferred method of discourse. However, for some, racism and white supremacy impact our identities, the core of our being, the humanity in us. For many of us, these issues interfere with our mental health, our physical safety, and sometimes our lives. Sharing stories, narratives, and experiences is relevant to humanistic and existential psychology as it opens the door for experiential change and learning. And this is what I hope to begin to facilitate today by sharing this narrative. I'm speaking from my identities as a woman of color and want to clarify that when I use the term person or people of color, I mean it both generally and specifically. I'm not speaking for all people of color and at the same time acknowledge that many friends, colleagues, and mentors of color have had similar experiences. However, this narrative is specifically reflective of mine. I would also like to caution you that some feelings of defensiveness, irritation, or anger may come up. I ask you to sit with and pay attention to these feelings as they likely signal something important. I hope that during the discussion portion allotted at the end of today, we will be able to talk about them. I also want to recognize that I only have 15 minutes um, in this narrative. I'm doing my best to accurately represent all sides of this experience and also acknowledge that that is nearly impossible to do with the time given. During my time in higher education, I was required to take a course that involved participating in a group where we talked about the here and now. Contextually, I was placed in a group of all white and white passing students, and this group occurred soon after a high profile killing of a black man. Going into this group, I anticipated racial dynamics would arise and recognize the potential of harm if not addressed. As a woman of color in these spaces and conversations, I've had countless experiences where I end up having to facilitate, educate, water down my own experiences and efforts to caretake for others, all while undergoing some level or form of racial trauma. This shows up as constantly having your reality and lived experience questioned because others may not have personally experienced it. Having to modulate how you express yourself to prevent being labeled or stereotyped. Feeling tokenized and putting yourself on display. Having to use your personal trauma as a teaching tool. Intellectual discourse over harmful dynamics and moments constantly having to pave the way in addressing racial dynamics and biases that are present because others chronically forget or aren't aware that they exist. Having to choose between silencing yourself or expressing your reality and facing the anger, rage, indignation, and potential gaslighting that often occurs. And lastly, fighting for justice when, other call, when others call for unity. Continually being forced and merely existing in these systems founded in white supremacy has sucked the life out of me. I feared participating in this here and now experiential exercise would not only exacerbate this existing feeling, but create additional harm. I raised these concerns with my professor and received the response that one, these issues are important and two, he didn't have the time nor the energy to restructure or make any changes to the curriculum. Just two weeks into this group, all of these issues came to a head with group members. Even individuals who initially expressed support for racial equity attempted to bypass equity and justice for unity. Messages of why can't we just come together? 
Why can't we just talk about our shared experiences and the ways in which we all struggle? Why can't we just have a nice conversation about this? And ironically, I don't get why you feel tokenized or feel like you have to educate us. I met with this professor again on this issue and he asked for solutions. I proposed the idea of taking a more structured approach to class or splitting the groups up differently. There was a clear divide between people who wanted to find some sort of resolution to this issue and people who wanted to bypass it. The professor refused my proposal to split up the groups for fear of discomforting some students based on my account. He did make participation in these groups optional. However, soon after the professor did agree to the idea of splitting up groups differently after a white student had offered the same suggestion. The group eventually split and since our last meeting, there has been no reconciliation. The last day of class, after receiving support and guidance from the program director, as well as continued conversations and meetings with the professor, he acknowledged that tensions had run high and that it was most largely due to the impersonal nature of Zoom and remote learning. The professor explicitly stated that he would not be open for feedback or discussion and ended the class. It would be easy to chalk this up to a problematic professor a racist experience or an isolated incident. In fact, this is how many of my classes in higher education have been. These are commonplace things that happen and this is the type of racial trauma that consistently happens to students of color. This is what we have to endure in most of our classes, experiencing the consistent refusal of people in positions of power to take stances for the safety and support of marginalized students. This sends the message that students of color must swallow and silence their pain, often to prioritize and protect white feelings. Despite continually offering suggestions, expressing personal harm, and pushing to create a, a more just, equitable experience, the system couldn't change without the action of the person in power. There's so much more to this narrative than I can even begin to describe with you all. In reality, there are more events, more transgressions, and more racial harm. For now, I want to unpack some of the themes based on what I have shared. The first is when people of color or a person of color tells you that something is harmful, do you believe them? And I intentionally and specifically use the word harmful here because this isn't about hurt feelings. It's about something that reaches far deeper and has a destructive impact. This professor's continually, continual usage of, of the phrases, I wasn't there, I don't know what happened, it sounds like your feelings were hurt, downplays and minimizes the impact of the experience. He also sent messages of, you know, I would obviously make changes if the nature of the harm was physical or sexual, but racial trauma isn't the same. And this brings us to a larger question of, why do white people, especially white men, get to be the gatekeeper on racial trauma? And I want to acknowledge here that intersectionality plays a role. Um, as women or female identifying people, we're often told that we're overreacting or too sensitive. And as a woman of color, this message gets amplified. And when you try and push back to be heard and understood, you run the risk of being labeled angry, mean, divisive, unkind, and ungrateful, all things that I've been called. The next idea that I wanna highlight <clears throat> is when people of color try to raise awareness to the hurt, harm, and trauma they experience, they're often ushered by notions of unity and coming together. And historically, this is a strategy used for decades to bypass the issue at hand and results in silencing people of color. And it highlights the fact that only some people's here and now experiences are welcomed and others are expected to check their experiences at the door. This professor um, expressed that he didn't want to shame some people by splitting up the groups differently. And this is another example of prioritizing white feelings and white fragility over the safety of students of color. 
Another theme that comes up in this narrative is the refusal by the professor to edit the curriculum and make changes in a timely manner while simultaneously sending message of, messages of, I hear you, I completely understand. And as a good friend once told me, if he really understood, he would have done something about it because harm is being done. And here, when it, it kind of highlights the, the misalignment between actions and words and how when they don't line up, people of color get harmed in the process. And it's confusing, emotionally taxing and traumatizing because you don't know who you can trust or what to believe. And to be quite honest, it's crazy making. It also kind of highlights this idea of performative allyship where I think people learn all the right things to say and all the right verbiage to use, but not treating people of color in your day-to-day -day life in a way that aligns. A conversation that's, that's coming up more and more and I think is really important is this idea of in intent versus impact um, and how impact is what matters because even the best intentioned people can cause harm, especially when they don't mean to. And in order to repair the harm that you've caused, you first have to acknowledge it. This professor suggested opening up a class discussion, which you know, sounds like he's being receptive and accommodating but he didn't understand that oftentimes in classrooms, the same dynamics play out just in a larger arena where students of color are carrying the burden of finding a solution to a systemic problem. This also reflects larger dynamics happening in society where black, brown and indigenous people are expected to find solutions to problems that they did not create. This professor also offered um, making participation voluntary as a potential solution, um, which again, sounds like he's being receptive and accommodating. And then it leaves students of color in a position where they're forced to choose between protecting their safety while missing out on valuable training opportunities or participating with the imminent risk of harm and racial re-traumatization. And that's not a fair choice to have to make. Another idea I want to highlight is, is at the end of class, this professor attributing the tension to this impersonal nature of Zoom and quickly closing any opportunity for discussion. And as, as we all probably are familiar with, this is a tactic of gaslighting and again, silencing groups and people that have historically been silenced. And with all this effort and energy, I, I sincerely hope that things may be better for students in the future for later cohorts, but at what cost? Why do students of color have to drive themselves into the ground and experience ex extensive racial trauma in order for slight changes to be made? And the last point I wanna highlight is that there has been no resolution with these group members and I continue to exist in spaces with these individuals, particularly risky settings, where I'm required to share vulnerable parts of me, including my genogram and early memories and participate in small group supervision. And this highlights a, a larger idea of not being able to escape the people who caused you harm or protect yourself. And <clears throat> the bind that students of color feel when wondering if they can express this to their supervisor or their professor. Another common experience that makes this hard, you know, to communicate this with professors is the urge to protect others' identities, which again, I think is a common experience for people of color. And so how do you advocate for yourself without outing other people and the harm that they've caused you? And why do we try so hard to protect others' identities? I think is a larger question. And I, I, I assume, you know, some of you are probably thinking, well, Saba, why didn't you just try and resolve things with, with these people? Um, and I asked myself the same question. Um, and, and what kept coming up for me is, how do I engage with these people without having to educate them or 
highlight the racial harmful, the harmful racial dynamics um, without being re-traumatized. And very often people of color fall into these roles of educator or caretaker or having to minimize their own feelings of anger, betrayal and pain. They jump in to forgive others often without apologies because protecting yourself from harm and setting boundaries with the people who cause you harm can lead to a very isolating, lonely place. Thank you all for listening and I hope to discuss more during um, the, the discussion portion later today. Great, thank you, Saba. That was wonderful. All right, and uh, John, you're up next. I believe you can, are set to be able to share your screen. Are you there, John? I'm not seeing him in here. He maybe uh, had his. Uh, no, I'm I'm here, Lewis. I'm here. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'm here. Just give me give me. I'm I'm trying to fight with my tech, so just <laughs> bear with me for half a second um, while I, because if I share the screen first, then I can't see the other thing. So hold, hold on one second. Let me just do this in the right order. All right, so first I wanna share my screen and then I wanna open my PowerPoint. All right. All right, can everybody see that screen? Yes. Okay, good. And now I'm gonna do my PowerPoint. See All right. can, can people see my PowerPoint? Yes. All right. Great. All right. So um, we've heard a variety of really illuminating and insightful perspectives already this afternoon. And I'm honored to have an opportunity to participate in the discussion. In the few minutes that I have, I'd like to discuss multiculturalism and diversity from the perspective of personal construct psychology. And as some of you know, personal construct psychology, which is also known as personal construct theory, has played a big role in my professional training and in my development. And at its most basic, personal construct psychology holds that each person devises a set of psychological constructs, each consisting of an idea and its presumed opposite. People use these mental templates to organize their experience and to make predictions about other people in the world. Some personal constructs prove viable for living and others don't. Importantly, nobodies are exactly the same. And critically, even when our constructs prove viable by allowing us to successfully navigate our surroundings, they shouldn't be mistaken for those surroundings themselves. They represent, but do not reproduce the world as it is. As the old saying goes, the map is not the territory. I have found personal construct psychology to be a very helpful framework for thinking about many issues in my work as a psychologist and psychotherapist, including issues of diversity. So allow me to share a few examples that hopefully will illustrate why. So way back in 1955, psychologist George Kelly, the creator of personal construct theory, asserted something that I think must have sounded radical at that time. He stated, it is important that the clinician be aware of cultural variations. At the same time, he also observed that clients aren't merely products of their cultures. Still, he stressed that cultural variations have undoubtedly provided clients with much evidence of what is true. And this has a number of implications. One is that culture impacts how people construe the world. That is, how people culturally construe has a large impact on the experiences that they have and the way they make sense of the world. But at the same time, Kelly said something quite interesting. He added that when you know somebody intimately, it tends to make a cultural interpretation of that person's behavior seem artificial and mechanistic. So culture is important, but we don't wanna reduce people exclusively to culture because if we do that, then we run the risk of falling into stereotyping. We look at somebody and we say, this is their cultural background and therefore here's what they're all about. But Kelly saw culture more broadly. 
He said that culture very much influences how clients construe events, but while it might constitute by providing the context in which a person lands, it doesn't wholly determine how said person understands the world. So using this nuanced balancing, I think of freedom and determinism as a starting point, I'll now turn to a number of personal construct psychology concepts and discuss how each of them, I think, can help us think about culture and diversity in our current world. So the personal construct psychology terms that I'd like to touch on each briefly are constructive alternativism, experience, individuality, commonality, and sociality. I'll briefly explain each one and then I'll talk about implications for thinking about multiculturalism and diversity, or at least a few implications. There's probably more than I'll be able to talk about today. First, let's start with constructive alternativism, which is the fundamental premise on which all personal construct psychology is based. Kelly's concept of constructive alternativism holds that all of our present interpretations of the universe are subject to revision or replacement. There are always some alternative constructions to choose among in dealing with the world, and no one needs to paint himself or herself into a corner. No one needs to be completely hemmed in by circumstances. No one needs to be the victim of his or her biography. And we call this position constructive alternativism. Constructive alternativism provides a basis by which we can entertain alternative constructions. Right? This is important in all areas, but surely it seems critical when it comes to discussing diversity and multiculturalism, because it offers, I think, as a starting point, encouragement to entertain viewpoints far into one's own. Engaging with people from diverse backgrounds who likely hold worldviews very different from one's own can be greatly enhanced when we move away from presuming our own constructions mirror reality verbatim and thus are right, best, or normal. And instead, we subtly shift in an attempt to credulously open ourselves to alternative constructions. This isn't always easy, but we accomplish this shift by trying to construe the world from a different point of view. As such, constructive alternativism provides a point of departure, I think, for efforts at multicultural understanding. So let's talk about a number of other personal construct psychology concepts that I think can help expand on this notion. The experience corollary. It's something that Kelly said was very important in thinking about how people come to construe the world in particular ways. Kelly said that when it comes to experience, people's constructions vary as they successively construe the replications of events. That's a fancy way of saying that people are personal scientists. They develop constructions that make certain predictions, and then they test these out through their experiences in everyday life. For instance, many white people in the United States have long held the construction that they were living in a country that was no longer racist and had moved past racist ideas and beliefs. But I think recent experiences, such as the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, along with the Black Lives Matter movement, have finally shown many people that this construction doesn't hold up. They may need to revise it in light of experiences that have invalidated it. Of course, people of color have lived a very different experience, and so the constructs they have devised about race and equity in American culture are often quite different. Unfortunately, one of the ways that people prevent spurious constructions from falling by the wayside is by not testing them out, right? We avoid situations where we're exposed to new experiences that require us to test and challenge our understandings, so we don't have to face them, not holding up to scrutiny or the exigencies of daily life. In keeping with this, the experience corollary encourages white Americans to test their constructions around racial discrimination and to seriously grapple with experiences that challenge these constructions. When these constructions don't account for experience very well, personal construct theory urges going ahead and revising them. In the past year or so, it seems like some people have begun to see um, that a lot of privileged folks in the United States are opening themselves to experiences that have pushed them to reconsider long held constructions about race. Experiences that invalidate people's constructions hold the potential to result in them revising constructions they previously clung to. So although we wish it had happened sooner, it does appear that 
many Americans are finally allowing the racial experiences of the last year to open them to the prospect of revising their privileged constructions of race and justice in American society. Now let's turn to individuality. Right, another way of thinking about multiculturalism and diversity is through Kelly's individuality corollary, which says that people differ from one another in their constructions of events. And this is important because it reminds us that individuals within a culture have unique and individualized construct systems. And sometimes we forget this. When we do so, we easily slip into stereotyping people by assuming that everybody from a particular background construes in a like-minded way. From a personal construct perspective, it's very important to consider the individualized constructions of any given person and not simply reduce people to their cultures. But Kelly doesn't leave it at that. Importantly, he counterbalances individuality with another notion called commonality. Kelly's commonality corollary maintains that when we employ constructs similar to those employed by others, our psychological processes are similar. Of course, people within a culture often share commonality in construing. They've probably had common experiences and this has ostensibly resulted in shared constructions. In other words, common experiences can yield common or similar ways of construing events. For instance, people from the same ethnic or religious community have likely shared certain experiences, and as a result, they've come to hold common ways of construing the world. At the same time, of course, Kelly was very aware that people sometimes exhibit commonality in construing even when their experiences in the world are different. Have you ever met somebody who comes from a very different background from you and a very different experience than you do, but you're pleasantly surprised to find that the two of you construe things in very similar ways. Kelly's commonality, Carly, again reminds us that culture is critically important, but not wholly determinative. People from the same cultural background can construe in common ways, but people from different cultural backgrounds can also construe in common ways. And if they don't initially have commonality in construing, they can come to do so through the next personal construct psychology term that I'd like to talk about, sociality. So another important personal construct psychology concept that I think we can use to think about culture and diversity stems from Kelly's sociality corollary. Kelly said that sociality occurs when we take the time to construe another person's construction processes. And in so doing, we come to play a role in a social process involving that person. This means you endeavor to construe the constructions of others. You look at somebody and you ask yourself, how is that person construing the world? And how can I construe their construction processes in a way that really seems to get at how they understand things? Of course, you can never fully get inside somebody else's experience. You can never construe the world precisely as another person does. The closest you can get is by devising your own construction of another's processes, one that gives the other person a sense that you understand where they're coming from. And when you do that, you can develop a firm social relationship with that person. You can genuinely form what Kelly called a role relationship with them. So if I construe the experience of somebody else who is from a vastly different background from my own or has gone through experiences I haven't, I can work to construe their way of construing things. And as a result, I can come to play a supportive social role in relationship to them. And they can do the same for me. To quote Kelly, Simply stated, the point is that one does not have to be like certain people in order to understand them. And I think this is extremely important in our current context. Obviously, white Americans haven't experienced the racism, prejudice, and discrimination that others have. And yet, if they engage honestly and openly in sociality, I think they can construe the construction processes of those who have, and in so doing, develop a better understanding of what others' experiences have been like. Admittedly, this isn't the same as experiencing those things oneself, but through sociality, people can form role relationships that can lead to commonality of construing and can help benefit everybody by allowing us to move forward together in fighting discrimination and oppression. So let me wrap up by building on one last quote from Kelly, who offered the following observation back in 1955 that I think remains pretty apt today. Kelly said, where the cultural identifications are different, or where one person has given up seeking common ground, individuals can be found living out their existence next door to each other, but in altogether different worlds. I think that's often what we see around us. People, often but not always, from different backgrounds, 
not construing in common ways and not working sufficiently to construe how other people construe things. And so when white Americans fail to construe how their black neighbors are experiencing and construing the world, they miss out. You can be right there with somebody, right next to them. And as Kelly astutely pointed out more than 65 years ago, still be living in an altogether different experiential world. One of the things that I think most of us would like to see is people engaging in sociality as we struggle towards commonality in construing and forging a better world together. Much easier said than done, of course, but a worthwhile aspiration nonetheless. So I'll leave it at that for now. I very much look forward to the discussion period, and I thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me today. Thank you, John. Okay, as we move on here to the, to the end, we're gonna shift now to focusing some just on the applications and discussions. So feel free to go ahead and unmute your mic at this point and or unmute your mic if you, while you're talking anyway. And you can bring forth questions for, for anyone on the panel. 